Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am here with my friend, Jason Tanioli. He is, oh my gosh, he does so many things. Can I even think of all the things that he does? So he's a musician, of course. He is a piano artist. Um, he sells sheet music. He, he has a, a background in banking. Um, he's an amazing marketer, amazing marketing mind, and he has several different companies. So I'll let him tell you all about that. But let's get started with your background in music, Jason. How did you get started in music and specifically in piano and a little bit about your journey there? I, getting started in music, I, I started like a lot of people. I had a mean mom that made me practice piano. <laughs> Good and job, mom. <laughs> so thank goodness. Um, when, when I'd not want to practice and, and I would cry and whine and, you know, throw tantrums and she, she made sure I did my practicing and it forced me to, to at least get to a certain level that I think, I think there's that breakthrough level that a lot of musicians get through, whether it's piano, guitar, whatever it is, where it now you kind of are pretty good at the, the instrument. And then all of a sudden it kind of opens up to you. Um, and so luckily I, I hit that point. My, I, I think I had a natural gift probably for hearing music and in ear for it as well. But uh, in general, that's how I got started. Um, was kind of classically trained. Uh, never had heard of a fake book until, you know, seven or eight years after I'd even finished piano lessons and graduated from high school and all that. And uh, nobody ever bothered to tell me that what a fake book was. And when I discovered that, I was like, changed my world. And then um, thank goodness for YouTube and, you know, the online world with all the guitar tabs and learning that um, really just made it so much easier for me to you know, progress, I feel like as a musician. Uh, and then basically as I started writing music out, I, I decided I wanted to share it, uh, started doing piano books, uh, that are, you know, just like easy listening, put you to sleep type of new age piano. And, and I, as I've, as I've done more and more of that, I, I did another book, another book, I think I've got 14 or 15 books out now, um, recorded about that many albums, um, uh, done, done fairly well with the streaming world, um, as well. And, and so that's, that's my start in music. We'll definitely get into all of that. But first of all, we, we jumped over your background in banking. So were you doing all this music stuff while you were doing the banking thing? Was it just kind of on the side and as a hobby? Yeah, it was kind of on the side. And, you know, I, I didn't have any expectations that a musician could make money. And so I had my real job that made money and that was, it was fun. And, and so uh, so as I was in the, in the banking side for, for a long time, um, I, I had the opportunity of working with John Schmidt. If you've heard of the piano guys, he's done very, very oh, well. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so John, I was at the bank and I used to sponsor John's shows before he was even teamed up with Steve, the cello guy that he plays all the time with. And so, uh, I, I met him through, through a music producer up at the studio and he was recording a lot of stuff on his own still at the time. And that's kind of how I got started in the music and recording was we'd sponsor his concerts and we'd bring a bunch of clients out and, uh, still just fantastic guy, a good friend of mine. Um, one of the best people I know in the world, but, uh, that's what really kind of spurred me on to, to start doing something with my music. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, been around a lot of talented people that have helped make me better than I feel like I am at, at the music. So how much music were you doing while you were working at the bank? Like, did you actually create your, your piano books then and, and albums and things while you were still working? Yeah, I, I, I released some books and I'd call around to the music stores kind of up the, up, you know, the neighborhood area music stores. And I got to the point where I had, you know, it was probably a dozen stores that, and they were super supportive of me. I didn't think they'd really want to carry the books. 
uh, per se, but uh, I, you know, I printed like 50 copies, I think of the first book I did and it was called wedding day and it had a bunch of flowers on it. It was terrible. It was, the music was good. The, the cover and the marketing was terrible. <laughs> and, and so they, they ended up um, taking it and like within a couple of weeks, they called back and they're like, Hey, we want more of those books. I'm like, really? And so um, at that point I thought, well, I'll do a Christmas book. And that um, did really well for the, the Christmas season. And, and then um, it just kind of led to one thing to another. I, I did a hymn arrangement book and, you know, I'm in the Utah area. So you've got all these old classic hundred year old hymns that, you know, Christian hymns and that, that was a hit. So people were playing that for preludes. And I think it's just one of those where over the, the next 10, 15 years, the, you know, I did more hymn books and more hymn arrangements and more original songs and more Christmas songs. And it's just, you just chip away at it little by little. And when did you start selling them online? I want to say we did, it was probably 2006 or so. Um, I mean, we used to have to code the websites. I mean, it was a, right. it was so expensive to do and it was not something I knew how to do myself. And so you'd have to, if I wanted to add a song or a book, I had to have the developer go in and code it with. And so it was not easy. Um, but, uh, I think I paid four or $5,000 for my first website and then you'd have to redo it a couple of years later. And, you know, cause, cause it just wasn't like WordPress. we started building finally in WordPress. Uh, but even the themes and the coding wasn't what it is today where, you know, you can spin up a theme for, and, and have a pretty decent WordPress fight for a thousand to $2,000 that, that looks really good. Yeah. And did you have the, was the e-commerce like on your own site or did you ever put it on, you know, Shopify or places like that? So I've just used Woo WooCommerce. So okay. it's um, just free through um, WordPress. We use Elementor um, now for everything. Um, there's some plugins that you can add where, you know, it's pretty easy with some tables where you can allow people to listen to music you can listen to, you know, pull up a sample music, uh, do all of that. I mean, it's, you definitely got to spend a little bit of money on some plugins, but once you have them in place, I mean, I, I very, we do small updates, not, not big re redesigns anymore. And we haven't done a big redesign almost in 10 years. That's great. And do you keep it only exclusively on your site? Like you don't put your books on Amazon? So I, so funny story with Amazon, the, the music stores, some of the music stores do really well with putting sheet music on Amazon where it's to the point where I know it's like 20 to 40% of their business they do. Cause if you're in a you know, little town and you've only got so many piano teachers. Um, so uh, I have several stores that will put my stuff on online. So you can go and buy my books on my website for, let's, you know, about $20, but um, on Amazon, the stores will turn around and they'll stick it up there for twenty nine ninety five or something. And so it's great. I'm thrilled. And they sell a lot of them. Uh, they'll sell books at twenty nine ninety five. They're winning and they still buy from me. And sometimes I know that probably drives traffic to my site for people that really want to look a little deeper. And, and so it's, I feel like it's been a total win-win going that route. Um, I do have some of the stuff that I'll stick on Amazon myself, but it's, um, it's very, very small, like a couple hundred dollars is all, I mean, we just don't push promote that at all. Right. And I know that you've been really, you know, kind of creating traffic through Facebook ads and, and I don't know if you use Google ads as well, but how, what made you think like, oh, I should build a funnel around this and, and start putting traffic out there. Like most musicians, like that makes their head spin. You know, I, I'd done, I'd done pretty well with the music even before that between the stores and the, and with the website. I mean, I was making as much as a school teacher, which, you know, more than a school teacher probably, which is impressive, I guess. But um, I, I kind of ran across the click funnels um, just the whole software and the one funnel away challenge. So that's really where I got started. Somebody's like, you got to try this. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I just sold my software company and I thought, okay, cool. sounds interesting. And so, um, I dove into it. I did, I did not think it was going to work. Um, uh, the more I'm like this funnel things, just not people want to shop and they they've got their lists. Um, this is not going to work. And so I helped my friend build a kind of his whole, build out a whole funnel system. Um, he was a, he does divorce planning for people. Like, could you pick a more weird topic? Right. right? So, and it's a really cool service that he does and it helps a lot of people. So ah, I'm game. So we, we built this divorce planning pros <laughs> tool, um, total failure. I think we, I think he put like $10,000 of paid traffic into it in Facebook. I think we, we maybe sold like $200 total. Oh <laughs> it was horrible. 
I mean, just uh, should have been taken out back and shot. Well, people before. aren't excited to like, you know what I mean? Like they see that they don't really necessarily want to click. Right. They're right. Like, like, oh, they're going to retarget me with divorce stuff. That's all I yeah. need them. You know, yeah. if your life's I going feel bad through. enough already. <laughs> so anyway, so that was my first foray into funnels. Um, did a couple other things that were interesting along the way. And, and then I, the pandemic hit and, you know, thought, you know what, we've had a little bit of success with this for some other people. I really ought to just do what Russell says, uh, Russell Brunson says, and, and just go for it. And so uh, it, was, it was about June and I, I basically built a really basic funnel. It was a free plus shipping offer. Uh, hey, here's my most popular hymn arrangement book for the piano. If you're looking for music to play, click here. Um, I bought all these. I just decided with the pandemic, I'm going to give them away. It's eight ninety five, and and I just went for it. And then I had all the upsells because I knew I was going to be upside down on it. And, and all of a sudden, so I'm literally like giving books away and not even not covering the, it wasn't even covering the cost for it. And within about two weeks, we were shipping like 150 books a day. Like it was crazy. And, and how, Facebook how did you traffic. Fulfill that? I mean, you obviously weren't ready for it. <laughs> oh no. I mean, we, I was buying like labels, you know, the 30 sheet label type of thing and, and doing mail merges. I mean, we didn't even have like anything through ShipStation or stamps.com. We were going like the poor post office. We'd go down there with a hundred things and they just, you know, measure, they'd weigh every single one of them. They're, they're awesome. They've got this little tiny post office. They're such good people, but the normal post office would have told me to take a hike. <laughs> so um, anyway, so yeah, we were having fun doing that. I mean, we were getting conversions for like $3 a, a book. So I'd spend about $3 and make a sale. And uh, when I had enough people buying additional stuff and adding on that, it was, we were making some money. It was like, Whoa, this is working. And all of a sudden the email list starts growing really fast and I've got, you know, 12 or 14 other books. And all of a sudden I can email them and say, Hey, you know, Ken, do you like this? And, you know, see if you like this one too. And, and all of a sudden the orders, I mean, we, we 10 X what we, we would do on the website um, without funnels because of what we did through funnels. Wow. So you had a funnel around a specific book and then you would then like on the back end, you would send them emails saying like, Hey, if you like this, we've got these Correct. over here. Yep. One of the, one of the most, I mean, here's, here's a secret for you for any e-commerce person. So I've got, if you, if you come onto my website and you order from me, so um, this only happens one time. So it's just got a, it's a one-time timer, but if you don't come back and order from me again in 30 days, I will, I send you a coupon code and just say, Hey, just wanted to uh, check in with you. See how you like the music. And you know, if you're looking for a new song to play, here's a coupon code. That's I think it's like $5 or so, or $4 and 50 cents and go buy another, go pick another song to play, um, download it. It's on me. <clears throat> and, and what I'm essentially doing is it's recapturing people, pulling them back into my world. But it's also, if you think about it with the website, it teaches that person how to purchase and how to buy and interact mm -hmm. with me. And so it brings them back to that point, um, which is, I think a lot of e-commerce businesses, you know, they make that first sale and then they have a really poor onboarding or follow-up program. And really the gold is in those people that are, are part of your list already. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, that's true for mu music artists as well. It's like you, you get them on your list and a lot of artists that I work with, they, they like just focus on getting the people on their list. And that's it. And it's like, no, like the whole point of the list is to nurture them so you can get them right. to do other things, <laughs> you know, right. but they, they're thinking about the list as like the ultimate goal. And it really isn't. There's no point of the list if you're not utilizing it. Right. I, and it's, it's not just musicians, it's every business. And I, I think I've, I've heard a stat that I think is pretty accurate is if you, um, you have an email, if you have an email address, it's worth about $12 a year for you in revenue. And it's kind of an industry norm. It's like a dollar a month. Yeah. Yep. Totally. I, I, I've actually done an analysis of my email list as an artist, you know, back when I was touring and stuff. And I could, I actually think I figured out mine was like $2 and 60 cents or something. Cause yep. I was oh, able to on things like, Oh, I got a, a student or I got a demo or, you know, gigs or whatever from my email list. I could find, I could look and be like, Oh yeah, this person's on my list. That's how I got that. Yep. I, I think, you know, I see so many musicians that just don't even bother to put a, you know, email collection out there. You know, it's the easiest thing to do, but it, it, that, that will pay more dividends. I think than any thing you can, if, you know, e-commerce music, no matter what the business is, I, I go to these piano stores and I'm like, do you guys have a list of all your people that come and buy from you? 
Oh no, we don't. We used to do that. But then I, I just talked to one the other day and he said, I used to collect every email address uh, from everybody. And we sent an email out and he said, he got one person that complained and said, why are you emailing me? You know, and okay, just take them off your list and don't spam. Them. But the other 2000 people you might've emailed probably appreciated you, you know, just find your people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I know. Some, sometimes people are just so worried of what people are going to think about them if they send them an email or something. Um, so, okay. So this is, I think this is amazing because I had not heard of anyone that was doing this well with using sheet music and funnels. So let's like, let them know how well you did. And also I really <laughs> want to know or how well you're doing. And I want to know if you think that it it's a really a function of the pandemic or you're still doing as well now? I, I would say the pandemic was huge um, for people wanting to learn music or, you know, sit down at the piano or, you know, I think just music in general, people kind of had that reset and kind of had time on their hands to, to do music. So that absolutely was huge. I think uh, as you look back on the pandemic, Facebook traffic, I mean, they had more traffic coming into their site because everybody wanted to know what was happening in the world. I don't think we'll ever see that happen again in our lifetime um, where everybody was just, you know, that was like the communication channel. So traffic became so cheap to, to reach people. And then uh, for about a, the, the first year of the pandemic, you didn't have any of the iOS 14, you know, Apple privacy stuff. That's really just completely destroyed Facebook's uh, model for, for paid traffic um, and a lot of other things. I mean, that's a whole nother debate for another day. So I think absolutely. Yes. That made a difference. Um, I mean, if I look back, like on the last year, we, we shipped about 28,000 packages um, of, of music. And so some of those are single books. A lot of them are going to be multiple books or multiple things or CDs. Um, I think we shipped well over 6,000 CDs last year, uh, just at Christmas time, um, which was, you know, you'd think CDs are dead, but um, as an order bump, um, if you're selling a book, having a CD on there, you're kind of crazy not to, cause I can, I can offer that C CD for like six ninety five or $7 that goes along with the music. And most people will add that on there. Um, well, I would say about 20 to 30% of people, it's, it's kind of surprising how many still want the CD, even though, can you still buy CD players? Like, you know, it's, you know, but uh, the other thing I think for me is a lot of my piano playing people that buy my music, sheet music are oftentimes skew older. So it's yeah, that 50 plus that, I know female demographic, um, who's, you know, the, the mom or grandma that plays piano or teaches piano or, you know, that that's my demographic on the piano side for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that does make a big difference on who would buy it, but I, I do still think people are buying CDs now from artists. I think it's sometimes for a different reason, you know, it's more like a, a memory or, you know, just yep. something to have. Right. Yep. And it's a support the or to support the artist. They like the yeah. artist. Yeah. But in this case, I think it's actually as a tool. Yep. Absolutely. And the other thing we did last year that I think was really, I mean, really was a game changer for us is um, we had, I did a, a storybook with a friend of mine. So we actually did a whole bunch of research because a lot of about half of the music I've done has been uh, old traditional Christian hymns. They're just really pretty melodies. I mean, doesn't matter what Christian church you're in, you've probably heard these, a lot of, you know, the amazing graces and, you know, stuff like that, that people know. And so we, my friend tell is an amazing storyteller. So we dove into all of the kind of origin stories of the, those, those specific hymns, trying to find some sort of inspirational story. Uh, and for, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know uh, the name, Paul Harvey, I mean, he was a radio personality for years. A lot. If, if, you know, if you know, Paul Harvey, you'll date yourself, but He's I grew the, up listening to him at noon. The story, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> he was one of the best every day at noon. I think probably a fourth of the, United States listened to him at noon to get the news and then they'd get his story. And so it's the same type of thing where it's this just really cool three to four minute aha story that you could tell, um, you know, I guess you could do it on a radio program or tell over the pulpit or something like that. But, but we just kept it like, 
you know, Hey, did you know that this is how the story of amazing grace came to the guy who wrote it? And this was his story of what went into his life to make that happen. You know, and we have, you know, like the Horatio Spafford, if you know, the, um, it is well with my soul. You I was going to say that's what, that's a big one that you, Oh hear. my gosh. That's like one of the most touching stories ever. But I mean, the guys, you know, wife and daughters and kids are all on his boat. The boat sinks, you know, and he, they die. And then he's selling out to go. His wife was the only one that survived. He's selling over to, to find him in the, captain of the ship told him this is where they sunk and that's where the idea came to him for the song you know just these really uh, just impactful stories and i think when you know the story behind these songs it just means more and so we we did a book and we did it's called stories of the hymns and i think there's 41 stories in it but that was that was just incredible and we released it just in time it was november 3rd i think we released it and i, I put that funnel up and we'd sold out of the first 5,000 copies. I thought for sure that would get us through clear till Christmas. And we were sold out of those copies uh, before I, like we'd sold another like 3000 copies and I'm calling my printer saying, Hey, can you print these fast? And they're like, we can't get paper. They literally, I think they sent a truck clear to Tennessee to, they found some place that had paper and they, we paid an extra $800 for a truck shipment to, to bring paper so they could actually print it. Cause there's a paper shortage. Wow. <laughs> so, but we, we went through about 20,000 copies of that in a three month time period. And I mean, it's just been, it's been crazy. So that's amazing. That is amazing. That's so, without any retail stores. We didn't even let it, we didn't even have that through a retail store available or even Amazon. Um, we did do, you asked about Google ads. We did Google ads for that one. And that um, worked incredibly well with Google shopping ads. Um, we did, you know, everything else was funnel, but I think last year when I combined the two um, we probably spent about $350,000 on paid traffic through Facebook and Google, uh, you know, so we got really good at it, but it's, you know, it's been a roller coaster ride for sure. Wow. And so what, what is like the profit margin on those? On, you know, it depends on every, every book. Um, right. It's, and I think the, the hard part is, you know, if somebody's buying just one book, um, we'll have it be full price. If we can, if we can get somebody to buy two or three or share it with a friend, yep. you know, but by all means, gosh, I'll, I'll give you a half off almost on that second or third copy. Cause you've already covered the shipping costs and, you know, and so, and, and if it's going to help get, get that book into other people's hands, um, it's, it's just gotten really, really well to offer, a you know, you just bought this book. Do you want to, do you know a friend that plays piano or do you know a friend that like these stories and would you like to give it to him? Uh, we even tested one out, um, where, uh, for the stories of the hymns at Christmas time, Hey, do you want to buy 10 copies in addition to this to give to all your friends and family? And, and we had hun several hundred people that did, I'm, I'm sure that was their family or friend gift that they gave to everybody. It was great. I can imagine that is a great gift, I think. So, especially if you have a lot. So you get a $30 book that, you know, it's $29.95. I think is what we had as a retail price that stores were selling it for. And, you know, you know, we'll give them to you for 12 bucks a piece. If you get 10 of them done. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I also know that in your bio, it says that you have had over 100 million streams of your music, which amazed me. Um, how, how did that happen? Like you obviously have a lot of albums, right? So you have a big catalog. I do. But, you know, is there anything that you did to really boost those dreams? You know what, boy, I, it's, if I could figure out what the code was for having an album be successful, I'd, I'd have a whole lot more streams. I mean, I've had some albums that have really caught on to the playlist and I have others. I think the title of the, the albums makes a difference. I think how early you maybe were to the game. I've got a lot of friends that play piano and they're great, uh, but they were really early on on Pandora or some of the other streaming platforms and got on some of those playlists that were, you know, the staple. And so uh, I think there's, there's probably a, some level of how early on you were to the game. And there's probably some level of luck. And I think there's probably some level of um, how well you title your songs or your, your albums in order to get found in searches. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know. It's a combination of that. I think also, you know, most of my music is um, instrumental. So people put it on. It's funny. I can go on like Spotify and see the number of people listening at any given time live. And, you know, and you can see the day, but, um, I get tons of people to listen to me at night to go to sleep too. And so I, I, I love my people that put me on to, to listen at night. You know, there'll be 30 to 50 people at any given time and moment that are sleeping to my That's music. Fun. And you can just it's picture great. them all in their bedroom, <clears throat> you know, head on the pillow. You know, I'm just like, here, listen to this, or whatever. listen to this eight hour playlist so I can make money while you sleep. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
So <laughs> love that. Uh, Can, yeah. Are you able to tell, like, are they listening to you like on your artist page or are they listening to like playlists that you're on? It, it's a combination of all of the above. I mean, it's, you know, when you get into those numbers, I, I mean, there's a lot of playlists for sure. One of, one of the songs that's my top streaming on Spotify right now is um, it used to be that all of the hymns would be the number ones just because people recognized them, but I've got one that um, it's called emotions. It's, it's outdone for the last four or five months now outperformed everybody or every other song that I have. And uh, the crazy thing is I think it got put on some bathtub or bath time music, relaxing music thing. And I, and then all of a sudden, like it starts popping up on all these other um, playlists. And so thank goodness for whoever made that bathtub music playlist. Cause <laughs> Um, it's, it's done really well. <laughs> so funny. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. And so all of this, you know, all of your albums and your sheet music and all of that has built up your email list to quite a big list. I think you said 30,000 people, which is, we're, is pretty we're right around 30,000. Yeah. So Ooh, that's awesome. And what's so great about that is you have then been able to take that and create something for your super fans that I think you said you call song of the month club, which is, you know, akin to a Patreon or something like that. So I'd love to have you talk about that a little bit. Cause I know a lot of artists that listen are interested in doing something similar. Sure. And, and I debated on doing like a Patreon, but I, the more I looked into it, the more I thought I just want to control it and have full control. So I use keep infusion soft for uh, my CRM system still. And um, we actually implemented what's called, we use Stripe. Um, for doing the subscription. So that works really well, but there was a tool that we added called spiffy cart. So if anybody is a keep person out there, go check that out uh, for running the subscriptions. That's been really, really powerful and made it really easy for us to add in the bumps and other product sales as well. So um, when we launched that, um, my goal was just to one was to force myself to write music every month. So it was a little bit of a self-serving thing because sometimes I'll go in spurts where I'll go three, four months without really doing a lot. Uh, but, uh, with this, it's been great because, uh, I, I get to share draft versions that aren't completely polished, which is really scary to do as an artist. You're like, you want everybody to think you're polished, but, but I'll have a video. I'll have the, uh, I'll send them a PDF every month with that. I've also been able to pull in other musicians that I think are, you know, deserve to be shared out there. So I've had several piano artists that I'll bring in and we'll send out a, a sample song of theirs to all of my, my song of the month members as well. And a lot of times I'll do an interview very similar like this with, with those individuals so that my people can, can get to hear about their story and, and learn to like them. And, and really my goal with that is just to give back. I mean, it's adding a dish, lots of value. How can I serve my people? I know they like piano music. So, you know, what better way than to, to help introduce them to other people that I think are, are really awesome as well. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And I love that. I love that you didn't like make your Patreon about like a bunch of like crazy, you know, rewards or things that you would have to fulfill that would, would you wouldn't want to fulfill. Like you created right. this such that like, I'm excited to create, I'm not making the time for it. This is going to force me to do it. It's, it's a song of the month. I mean, that's, that's what I promise. And then I try to over deliver with, with a lot more stuff on top of that. I think for the last two months, I've actually uh, done two. And I think this month I did three, three songs for free. So their expectation is one song. And, and sometimes I'm like, I should hold that back and wait for next month. Like, no, no, no. I need to, this is going to make me get in and write some more music again. So I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there for people. So I, I hope they feel like they're getting a really amazing deal and know that I'm over delivering. Uh, in addition to the song of the month uh, to kind of take it to the next level, like you talked about doing kind of more VIP type of stuff. Um, I am doing a cruise this, this summer and a couple of weeks we're heading up to Alaska and we've worked out with the cruise ship where um, it's going to end up being a smaller group, which is awesome. But I've got two kind of on ship concerts just for my people in one of the bars there. So, uh, I mean, there's the really high level interaction, you know, get to know your, you know, I'll probably have dinner several nights with, with the people that are on the, on the cruise with us as well. And, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. That is very neat. That is very cool. 
And um, I know that, I mean, this is a great segue into something else that you do. I mean, I can't even understand how you're keeping like balancing all these things that you do, right? Because you also have a travel company <laughs> and you were mentioning like, as that, that being like a way that musicians could do something cool. Like you just said, like a, a specialized cruise experience for your people. And, right. and I think most artists don't do that because it sounds really daunting and overwhelming to plan something like that. But you kind of, you have that dialed in on your end and you offer that as like helping to, to create these experiences for other people. I know you've done it for modern musician. So tell them a little bit about your travel company and, you know, the story of why you started it, I think is really <laughs> cool as well. Well, I mean, you talked about it. So I spent 12 years as a bank marketing manager or marketing director. When I left um, there, we started a software company. And for the next five years, I, I built this software company and did really well. And then sold it's about five years ago, sold the software company and retired per se. And uh, that winter, it was in the summer when we sold it. That winter, I was down on a whitewater kayaking trip in Costa Rica um, with my doctor buddy that I've kayaked with for a, a long, long time. And we just had the greatest time. It was so much fun. And uh, I just thought, man, but it, as I watched, um, watched them, they didn't have a lot of systems. And I mean, they, they did a, a lot of things really well, but I could tell there was ways to improve. And I'm kind of one of those like mentor guys. I've done a lot of consulting and CRM consulting over the years and thought, and so I was talking to them. And, and learned some things. And then that night we were in the middle of jungle camp. Um, so we'd actually kayaked into this place. We'd hiked up the river and we're in this like beautiful jungle lodge. Uh, there's no service and it's dark. Everybody's gone to bed except for the guides. And the main guide tells his buddies in Spanish, cause I speak Spanish. Um, he says, Hey, um, I'm going to be leaving the company because I'm graduating from college that I've been doing for the last seven or eight years. And I've worked, um, every day for the last year and a half, 16 hour day, days, pretty much every day. And I don't have time to be with my two-year-old and my wife and I, I need to make a change. And so he goes, I'm going to try and probably go do something on my own. And I'm just, I'm kind of like 30 feet away, just enough that I can hear him. But um, all the guys are talking in Spanish. And um, anyway, he talks more, he comes over to me and get, you know, I was filling up a, my last drink for the night and uh I just sat down, he sat down and was just being friendly. I should start coaching him like, Hey, if you're going to build a website, don't do this, do this. And just trying to help this guy not make some really dumb decisions that we all have probably done as entrepreneurs, where we spend a whole lot of money and get very little value out of it sometimes. And so, uh, got, got home, um, just felt like, kept feeling like, man, I'm supposed to help these guys. I'm supposed to help these. I, this is crazy. This is a dumb idea. So I just kept mentoring and coaching him for like the next two, three months and giving him things that he needed to do to start his business. Still had, didn't have intentions of like going into business with him, but he'd do everything. And then he'd come back to me like the next week and he'd be like, well, I did all those. And then I went to the attorney and found out this and this and this, and we did that already. And then we found this out. What do you think we should do? And so really over three months, I'd kind of committed myself. Okay. If you do all this stuff, I'll build you a website. And I did not expect it had happened. <clears throat> Next thing I know, it was such a dumb idea that I, I didn't even tell my wife about it. Like, that's a terrible idea. Don't like do something like this ever and not tell your spouse or you will like never live it down. But, um, we're like three and a half months in and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh crap, I'm going to build this website. And then he's telling me, you know, Hey, can you come down and sign papers in Costa Rica? We're going to start this thing up and you're going to be part owner in it. So I go to Stacy that like kind of waited till she was tired. And it was like 10 40 and I thought, okay, she's tired. She's too tired to like get too excited about this. And, and I says, Hey Stace, how do you feel about maybe flying down to Costa Rica? And you know, what if we maybe had a business in Costa Rica that we'd be part of? And she sat up in bed and, Oh man, that was just don't ever do that to your husband. Um, Brie. <laughs> I will not. Well. Um, but anyway, a month and a half later, we were in Costa Rica signing papers. Uh, Stacy's been incredible. She's been so supportive of it. I did it as a more of a humanitarian thing, though. Uh, I've I, it's been going for five years. We made it through the pandemic. Uh, I've yet to pay myself a dime. Um, it's been a, the goal. I told Walter. I says when we do this. It's about taking care of your family, you know, changing lives. We want to make a difference for the people we travel with all of our guides. I told him, I says, we will be at a living wage. I don't care what it is, you know, <clears throat> where, whereas a lot of the guys down there, guides will make like $20 a day. Now mm -hmm. I says, we're going to pay way over that, like three to five times that I want to, you know, I want to make, do that to ensure we have the very best people. 
and we want them to not want to go anywhere else. And so, uh, and then, you know, the goal is to impact and, you know, I didn't tell Walter this, I said, I want to change the lives of the people, him, his family. And our first goal was to have uh, Walter's son, Ian, who was two years old, be able to move out of the little cinder block place they were in with no yard. I wanted him to have a yard that he could play in. Mm. And within a year we accomplished that Ian had a yard and a little trampoline. Um, it was awesome. You know, just changed their life and the whole trajectory of his family, probably for generations. Wow. And, and we've done that for, you know, probably a half dozen more people down there. And we've probably had, you know, two dozen people that um, have jobs and work um, with the Costa Rica thing, you know, we do an amazing, you know, the team does an amazing job down there. I've been able to extract myself from the day to day, which is great. But the, we also started a travel agency because we thought, well, we got to have something to own the, you know, the tour company down there so that we have a travel agency here that does cruises. My justification for that with music was that, um, well, this will help me be able to figure out how to do cruises for my people. And then I can help probably other artists that are maybe interested in, in putting together a, a cruise or a trip to Mexico or whatever it is they need to do. That's kind of these weird custom trips that are a ton of work and logistically are a nightmare if you're trying to do it yourself. But um, we've gotten pretty good at doing, doing the small group, unique trips. Um, we had a great time with Michael and, you know, about 20 people on the modern musician mastermind trip, um, last fall. And, um, we're doing another one with them. They're going to Mexico, I think on this next one, but, um, we're, we're taking like a group of, uh, police officers, um, uh, that have gone through like PTSD. Um, we're, we're setting something up with a nonprofit and bringing their wives with them to go that that's happening this fall down there. I'm really excited about that one. I think that's something that'll make a big impact as well. Um, we've got a veterans trip we're doing in the fall, um, the, um, uh, retired military or that have had injuries. I mean, it's, it's, we're just, it's, it's neat to see when you give people the ability to fly what they can accomplish, you know, they just need somebody to believe in them and, you know, a little bit of direction. And it's amazing to see what people are capable of. That's very cool. So if a music artist <clears throat> says like, that sounds awesome. You know, I have a, a group of, you know, a diehard group of, you know, let's just say a thousand fans. Right. And I think I, they'd be interested in doing something like this. What, how do they figure that out? Like what makes, how can they even decide like, where should I go? And like, what would it, you know what I mean? I would I mean, you, you can email me. I've got a team of people helping me, but if they were for sure with the musicians, I'd love to help them especially, but uh, Jason at amazing vacations, USA.com. Uh, that's the travel agency that'll come directly to me. It's um, amazing. And then vacations with an S on the end of USA.com. Uh, I'd be happy to help, you know, chat with you, listen to what you're thinking you want to do. I mean, the cool thing with like the cruise is if that's something that somebody wants to do, um, if you can get about 14, 15 people on that, um, you're going to be cruising for free. So not only can you do that, but if the way we'll set it up, sometimes we've had people come on trips like this where they'll make, you know, $5,000 have their trip paid for and go hang out with their people for the week. I mean, how cool is that to go have your vacation and make money on the vacation? That is really freaking cool. <laughs> so, like, I think I need to do a retreat like that for, you know, people in my community. I think you, you need a, you need a girl's trip down to Costa Rica. Ew, one of my oh my gosh. The, you know, women of substance <clears throat> or something, you know, Trip. One of my, yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite trips, Nalia, who was on season two of survivor for anybody who are survivor fans, she brings a girl's trip down almost twice a year now. And, um, I know she doesn't, she doesn't try to make money on it, but I've had others that are groups like that. And it's just so much fun. I mean, they're doing massages on the beach and they're going whitewater rafting and they're, you know, going, I mean, they're, we had, they went to a sloth sanctuary and got to like, take care of the sloths. But, uh, just warning you, if that's something people want to do, a lot of it is like cleaning up poop. So, nope. uh, I'm not sure that's the best one, but, uh, I mean, there's monkeys, I mean, going to the, the side of the volcano. I mean, there's so much wow. cool stuff you know, down there that, I mean, it, it, it'd be a great trip for you guys. Wow. Very interesting. Oh my goodness. Wow. So how are you, Cause I know, I know a little bit about how you're doing all this, but like, let the artists know, like, how are you balancing all of these things that you're doing and how do you, how have you been able to remove yourself from the day to day of a lot of it? I have an incredible team. I think one of the hardest things when you're wanting to grow is finding that person that you're willing to start giving some of the tasks to. Um, I've, I've got one person in particular that's just become that 
she's, she's helped me get to that next level. And then we added another person, another person and the, the shipping that we were doing when we were shipping like 200 packages a day, I mean, we had to grow and scale really fast. That's not normal for most people. So, um, but as you, you just gotta be able to recognize, Hey, this is something somebody else could do. And look for that person. It might be somebody in the Philippines. I've got seven virtual assistants in the Philippines now that help us um, at all different levels. One's, you know, helping us do the podcast and one's doing videos that we send out. I've got a guy in Serbia that helps me make music videos that I found on Fiverr. I've worked, he's worked for me for uh, three and a half years now. I mean, he's, he's does such good work, but I think the key is find those right people Uh, online jobs.ph. If you're looking for a virtual assistant in the Philippines is incredible. Love those guys. Uh, um, it's so affordable too. And, and you literally, you're going to change lives of people over there that you're helping. Um, what I would tell you though, is if you hire, you know, whether it's somebody here or wherever they are in the world, treat them with respect, treat them with dignity and and just value them. And, but also don't, don't be a micromanager so much that they're scared that they can't do things without giving, you know, you want them to be able to look at it and treat it just like their business and, and take it to another place. So like, I love it when, you know, they'll come back and say, Hey, we did this that you wanted, but you know, if you haven't thought about this, they're trying, they're always looking for ways to try and improve things. And that's, those are the types of people that you want to have on your team. Um, if you hire a VA, not just somebody that's just an order taker, you know, it's gotta be a right personality fit for you. Yes. That's been my experience with my VA that I also got off of online jobs.ph and I've, she's now worked with me for two and a half years. I can't believe it. Um, and she's the customer service manager and she is the same way. She'll just come to me and like, well, I did this, but like, I noticed that this, and I was thinking this and I'm like, yes. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have thought of that. You know? Well, and even better when they just went ahead and fixed it before. Right. So we, we do some of these website improvement meetings with the team and they'll be showing us, you know, Hey, this is kind of a problem. And, and I'm like, next thing I'm like, okay, you can go ahead and do that. And they're like, Oh yeah, we just went ahead and did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I definitely, I talk a lot about that, how you can utilize uh, VAs like that, as well as I've had my daughter working for me since she was 11. So she's now 19 and she still works for me. Uh, she doesn't have to go out and get a summer job at the mall or something because she's working for me. So awesome. You know, it's, there's so many people that have the right skill sets but also just have the right personality and determination and want to help you. That's what's most important. You can always teach them how to do stuff. Absolutely. Right. And I think as I look at over my career, even in the banking, I used to hire interns all the time. One of my favorite things was teaching and mentoring and, and doing that. Um, I, I have a lot of people that, um, you know, I've got this successful musician podcast that we're launching and, you know, people are asking me, well, what's, what are you trying to sell? What's the thing you're doing? And I'm like, I'm not, you know, I don't even have a course. Like I know there's lots of people that have courses on how to do whatever the thing is. And, you know, who knows, maybe I should do a course on how to sell lots of sheet music and, you know, you know, make seven figures in a year with, as a musician, but, um, maybe down the road we'll do that. But I think there's a lot of things that I, I just am happy to share what works and with people, it's just fun to see other people succeed and do well. Yeah. I mean, you were, you were such a, you're always telling me about this tool and that tool and this thing and this, you know, and I love that. That is that's so appreciated, but I also love that you've drank the podcast Kool-Aid now and you're just excited <laughs> about doing podcasts because I am a total podcast junkie. I've been doing podcasting since 2014 and I have three shows um, one of which is now hosted by someone else, but I hosted that show for almost a, le- uh, a thousand episodes. So, you know, I, I love podcasting. I'm glad that you're jumping into that space and I'm excited to be one of the first 10 episodes on your show. It's uh, we're excited. Yeah, it was a fun interview with you, Bree. We love, I enjoyed it. So that's the, the, that will be out by the time this interview comes out. So that's so, the successful musician, right? Success. So it's the successful musicians podcast. Um, yeah. So it's, we've just, I've, it's, I've got some incredible people that we've, we've interviewed already. Bobby Osinski. I mean, you're going to be on there. Um, I've got, and my goal with the podcast is not just to have, um, people that have made it, you know, or made lots of money or made their career with it. It's more of a, you know, what's, what is success or what, what do you define as success as a musician? And so it could be somebody who's working at a piano store and they've found success helping do that. And, and just find, you know, there's a lot more to music and finding that joy than, 
than what, you know, the, the dollar signs, I think for, and I think musicians need to recognize that and you'll be so much happier and create so much better music. If, if you can just figure out what you feel like is, is successful for you, it might just be playing a song for your kid, you know, playing a lullaby at night and having your, you know, I have my little Lindsay sits by me. She's six years old and sing songs at nights for me. I mean, that is better than making the seven figures, to be honest with you. Mm. Mm. That's, that's really great. And I think that's true. Um, but it's also, it's also nice to have some money in the bank, right? It, it is nice to make it has nice to have some money, but I, I, I see too many musicians out there that get discouraged and, yeah. you know, they think they're going to make their career and make all this money in music. And, and I think it's important for people to realize, you know, that's not necessarily every person's got their own path and, and way they're going to find. And so, be okay with that and, and enjoy the journey. And, uh, it's been so far with people I've talked to is those who have had a career and they work and then they fund their music and the experiences with music with their real job, um, and take the time to grow it. Almost every successful musician financially, that's like streaming or whatever, if you want to think of that as success, uh, they've, they work their guts out at a real job. I just talked to one yesterday. He worked for um, a lot of years in the restaurant business um, up until he was a manager. And, and then he quit his job finally after he was making well over a hundred thousand dollars, but he worked super hard for a lot of years to be able to fund his, you know, his habit of music. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that that's something that I really took from your story too, because I only knew about the most recent stuff, like the, you know, your funnel and the, and the sheet music and everything, which is amazing. Um, but I didn't realize you had 15 albums and all these books and you've been doing it over years and only now, you know, have you been able to do the seven figure thing <laughs> and so you put a lot of work into it and you put a lot of time into it, but mostly it's because you love doing it. It's, it's fun. It doesn't feel like work. I, and I think as I've looked at other people, um, I'll, I'll see these people that graduate from college and they think, Oh, I've, you know, I, I know everything now. And, and I think what I've tried to do throughout the last 20 years since I've been out of college is reinvest. You know, if I'm, if somebody's willing to spend three or four or $5,000 a semester on college, why wouldn't I do that? to continue learning and getting better and leveling up. And, and so I, you know, people that are listening to podcasts. I think most of the pe podcast people get that, but um, I think spending a thousand dollars a year, a couple thousand dollars a year to, to learn something that you would enjoy doing is a great move. I mean, it, you're crazy not to, why wouldn't you want to get better and, and learn new things and being humble enough to, to learn from somebody and realize, I don't know everything. Yep. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm a, like a learning junkie. So I totally get that. I just, I want to learn as much as possible all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Well, this has been so awesome. I mean, there's been so much to cover and so much, I think that's been really inspiring for musicians of like so many different paths that you can take to have whatever you feel is success in music and also be able to, you know, bring in that living wage. So you don't feel like you you are, are a starving artist. Cause I, I definitely don't believe in that. We do not have to be starving artists. So how can our listeners connect with you? What's the easiest way? Well, the Jason at amazing vacations, USA.com. Um, if you're thinking of the travel, if you want to go look at my website and you want to funnel hack me, it's Tony Oli.com. So it's think ravioli with a Tony on it. So T O N I O L I.com. So you, I mean, the website is not perfect. It's not it's, it's not amazing, but it, it gets the job done. And then if you go on Facebook and you want to look at what we're doing on there, um, you can definitely go check us out on that. And then the successful musician podcast that'll be coming out real quick here will be um, something that I think a lot of your listeners will really enjoy doing. Absolutely. Definitely check that out. And thank you so much, Jason. This has been really great. Thanks so much, Bree. Thanks for listening to the profitable musician show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. 
And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.